Welcome to our epic ocean, where critical solutions to a planet in peril are brought to the surface. Our epic ocean celebrates all that is epic about the ocean and why it is the planet's most vital resource. And now to our host, Rich German. In Maori and Polynesian mythology, Tangaroa is the god of the ocean. Tangaroa made laws to protect the ocean and its sea creatures. The essential mantra being, if you look after me, then I will look after you. As we are all well aware, and as ocean explorer Jacques Cousteau famously sounded the alarm in 1971 to the United Nations, our ocean is in trouble. And we need to raise awareness globally to protect it from further harm. While some ocean-related problems are better addressed through international treaties, solutions to marine and coastal issues vary greatly and are often best addressed at a regional level. These include land-based sources of marine pollution and coastal degradation, as well as unsustainable fishing practices, overpopulation, and development. It's important for us to understand better, at a local level, what can be done and what is being accomplished by organizations and individuals doing the best work, which can be replicated and scaled to communities worldwide. My guest today is focused on solutions to this big challenge. This is why we decided to get to know and share the work of Heidi Tate, the Tongarua Blue Foundation co-founder, an Australian not-for-profit dedicated to the removal and prevention of marine debris. Heidi's love for the ocean comes from 20 years as a scuba diving instructor. In 2004, she co-founded Tongarua Blue and the Australian Marine Debris Initiative as a way of not only removing the ever-increasing loads of trash in our ocean, but more importantly, finding ways to prevent debris from being released in the first place. She was named one of the 18 most influential women in ocean conservation by Ocean Geographic, and her mantra is, if all we do is clean up, that is all we'll ever do. From way down under in Australia, Heidi Tate, welcome to Our Epic Ocean. How are you today? I'm uh, doing very well, a bit rainy, but I'm um, happy to be indoors today, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a sunny day here in Laguna Beach, so... Uh, don't be too jealous. So I want to start big picture. Uh, excited to dive into this conversation with you. First question, why do we have so much marine debris? Where is it all coming from? I know, and it's only getting worse. Um, look, I guess there's two big things, right? The population of the world keeps getting bigger and we keep using and disposing of more stuff. So um, a percentage, even if the percentage remains the same, it's going to result in uh, a greater volume escaping out of our waste systems or our inadequate waste systems um, into the environment. And a lot of that will end up in the marine environment. For sure. So how did this become such a focus of yours? In other words, why do you care so much? Oh, look, I guess even as a kid, I used to spend a lot of time in national parks. Our parents used to take us there all the time um, for school holidays. So I always had a really strong connection with nature. Um, I remember being really young as a kid and feeling that energy when you get to some of those really beautiful places in the world where you just feel like really good energy. Um, and so I felt that connection at a very young age. Um, I spent a lot of time, you know, traveling around the world in my 20s and my 30s and became a diving instructor. Um, and through that, just started to see more and more rubbish, you know, in the ocean where I was living and working and playing. Um, and the concern started getting bigger when you started to see that impact on our wildlife. Um, and then living in, in Western Australia, just um, seeing the variety of rubbish in a really remote location. Like there's not just one thing. And the question was, where's it coming from? Why is it here? And more importantly, how do we stop it? And just felt that it wasn't on the radar back then. Mm. You know, people weren't really talking about it as they are now. So wanted to make some noise about it. Beautiful. So you just felt compelled like to do something because you didn't see enough other people maybe taking action. And we're going to talk a lot about action in this conversation. Uh, speaking of, Australian Marine Debris Initiative, I believe you called AMDI, is a national network of volunteers, partners, government agencies, and industry bodies focused on the removal and prevention of marine debris. The AMDI database is one of the largest and oldest marine debris databases in the world. Why did you create AMDI? Um, when I looked at all this rubbish that was on the beach um, in Western Australia in a national park and saw the wide variety of sources, 
um, it became really clear that there wasn't one solution that was going to be available um, to solve the problem because they were all coming from, from different places for different reasons. And when I started talking about marine debris, actually people started asking me why I had a problem with driftwood. <laughs> and that's what they thought marine debris meant back then. Oh, gosh. Um, so, you know, that awareness and education on the issue was, was very, very low. Um, and um, when we started to really think about um, the wide variety of stakeholders that you would need to solve the problem because of the sources being so varied, um, the first thing we needed was evidence. Otherwise, we'd be a group of people standing on a beach saying, hey, there's all this rubbish on the beach, do something about it. So the evidence enabled us to really look at um, what was impacting different areas of coastline, because what we see you know, in very remote Cape York, Australia, in the very, very tip of Australia, is completely different to what we would see on beaches around our cities in Melbourne um, and Sydney, for example. Mm. And so that evidence we hoped would be able to drive um, investment and focus um, and engage the right stakeholders to be able to address those specific issues. And, and so the database was the evidence and we needed, we needed evidence. We needed a starting point. We still do. Um, and not only now do we need that evidence to be able to inform policy, but we also need that evidence um, to monitor the changes that are being implemented to make sure that the bin that was put at a location to stop litter escaping into the environment actually has that the outcome that we, we were trying to achieve in the first place. Got it. And the database that you created, I believe, can be used on local and also international government levels and also really on that community level. Can you explain that? Yeah, so the methodology around the data collection was always around identifying the source. And so you can't you can't combine too many things in a category if you want to identify a source because it's too broad then. So the, the database has around 140 categories wow. um, and that really enables us to identify exactly what is uh, occurring on a beach um, to help us to track back to the, the source. Um, and so the way that that was developed means that you can take data and you can say, okay, well, this is what's impacting my local beach. Let's have a look at what's a local uh, litter input versus an offshore ocean current issue. Mm. So that's kind of like the first split because a very small community might have a very difficult um, time in trying to address um, waste originating from another country because it's come there from an ocean current. But sure. they can definitely do something about their local litter. So we want them to be able to understand you know, what we call it is um, a land sea source index. So roughly mm. what percentage are we dealing with as local litter versus what's offshore sources? And then exactly, you know, what those items are and what material that they are. Um, the point of the whole of the database with that tracking is to understand the exact point of loss. At what point does that item become litter or escape into the environment? And therefore, what needs to change at that point of loss to prevent that in the future? Got it. And it appears that you've created a model that is conducive to partnership and collaboration, adding more boots on the ground to reinforce your mission. Can you explain the long-term goals? And really what I want to know is what is your model for replication and scaling so that we can really maximize the impact? Yeah, I guess one of the biggest issues that we keep hearing about at international scale is databases that can't talk to each other. You know, you've got so many people starting new projects and new databases for the purpose of their own project without actually understanding how that can be used in different scales or in different contexts. So, you know, one of the goals was to try and get everybody to start collecting data the same way. Um, and it started at a very local level, but, um, you know, a lot of people understood the value of this and it scaled to become a national program. And now we even have countries um, in our region using our, our methodology and our database, which nice. really helps explain that regional story of marine debris or that, that signature. So um, I, I guess when we look at something, we want a, a model to be um, usable or data to be usable at that local scale. But when we look at um, different debris items, the point at what they should be intercepted at can be very, very different. And so you want, you want all the stakeholders to be able to input it there at the right level. So in, in some cases, you know, um, an item should be um, dealt with at a local, uh, a local government level. Um, some things should be done at a state level or national legislation, or some things should be done across an industry through industry bodies um, or at an international scale. And so finding out at what point each of these items should be intercepted at, enabling then the right stakeholder groups to come in. 
you know, is this industry best practice? Is it legislation that needs to be changed? Is it just education and awareness on how people use something or dispose of something? You know, there's not one single solution. So you really need that granular level of data to be able to help inform those different changes and, and those practices. Sounds like it's sounds like it's all of the above, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you're bringing up a great point. Um, one of the things I've noticed, I have my own nonprofit, and as I really dove into this world, I just observed so many wonderful people, passionate people about all these different issues. And yet with a lot of nonprofits, they're all kind of working separately. I think sometimes out of fear that if I work with you, you're going to take my donors or something like that. So it feels like a, a complex problem for you to say, hey, if we all just use this same software the same model and really work together we could make a much bigger impact um am i am i right and is that a, is that a hard thing to accomplish oh you absolutely nailed it on the head you know i often say and it's a horrible way to explain it but the conservation sector really doesn't have an overarching body to look after the sector like a lot of other industries do um yeah. the funding that goes into the sector is so small and you know a lot of the time you've got these organizations that are, are really just you know, fighting each other for these scraps of funding to be able to exist. Um, and the protection around existing means that there's, there can be a lot of distrust in, in collaborating together. So what we, you know, what we wanted to say is that, you know, we're all here for the, the goal of the same reason of trying to prevent, you know, all the stuff into our oceans. If Tangaroa Blue is able to host a platform that enables, you know, a lot of the other, uh, other organisations to be more effective in their work because they don't have to fund this platform themselves, then you know that can be our role. So we saw we kind of see that Tangaroa Blue is also another partner in the Andy, just like everybody else is, and mm -hmm. they're not giving anything to us. They they're using a platform that was built for that purpose, and but but it still is an issue, you know, and that's why we keep getting these new databases and projects popping up instead of people collaborating and actually researching what's already been done. Right. You know, the, the amount of emails I get all the time of these, someone that's had this brainwave um, <laughs> that, that wants me to give them advice on it. And I'm like, well, just do a bit of research of what's already been done in the last 20 years because you'll, you'll learn what didn't work and why um, instead of just starting from scratch again. Yeah, 100%. So you mentioned stakeholders and we've talked about partnership. Obviously, you can't do this alone. I'm curious, who's on your team? Uh, who are these other stakeholders, members, partners, and what volunteers are involved in your work? So we, we started, you know, really, really small. We started with me <laughs> and then we started with me <laughs> and, a, and a local volunteer who took all my Excel data sheets to create the database, you know, and, right. it, and it slowly grew from there. And people understood what we were trying um, to achieve. And we had some good um, good case studies of how data was used to influence change. And, and so people kind of under, understood. And I think that, you know, getting volunteer retention and getting partner retention is about them understanding that they're part of a solution. And particularly in this space, you know, if people go to the beach every week, every month, and they go and collect more rubbish and they do that for 10 years. Eventually they get very despondent. They feel like that they're rubbish collectors. Yeah. Um, but if they collect the rubbish, they collect the data, a source reduction project is put in place to address one of those items that they find. And then they see in the future that there's less of that item because mm. whatever source reduction project was implemented actually had an effect. They're not a rubbish collector anymore. You know, they're part of the solution. They're a citizen scientist and they're providing critical ongoing data to be able to manage and tweak and implement and, and um, monitor the, the strategies. So, um, you know, at the moment, we, we're very lucky. We were um, successful in a five year um, government tender back in the end of 2018. And the Australian government had never put five years of funding on the table for this issue before, but it enabled us to be you know, very focused and, and have confidence in what we were able to deliver and have funding for. Now, this mm. particular project was across the Great Barrier Reef and, and it runs through to um, June next year. Um, but that's enabled us to upscale and really update a lot of our um, resources. Our database and our app is actually going through a massive upgrade at the moment. So, you know, that security and funding has enabled us to grow. And we have a staff of about 30 at the moment that are spread all over the, the country. So we do a lot of Zoom meetings. <laughs> um, <I bet. laughs> but we have about 2,000 partner organizations that contribute at the moment to the database. Wow. Um, yeah, and I mean, if you look at the stats of what the AMD database has been able to 
um, achieve. I think we're around 27,000 cleanups. Um, you know, there's, there's almost 200,000 um, volunteering opportunities. And it equates to something like $25 million of, of you know, volunteer hours of what people want to contribute to this issue. But they want to see they're being part of a solution and not just picking up rubbish. Okay, so let's let's take a little time out and acknowledge Heidi. You were one, and I think this is a good teaching point for, for maybe even one person out there listening that wants to make a difference. You had an idea, you know, you saw a problem, didn't see it being worked on enough, and you said, I'm gonna do something about it. You were a one woman operation that now has 30 people on your internal team did you say 2,000 partners around Australia? And now you have federal government funding? Am I hearing all that correctly? That is yeah, it's, I, <laughs> I would never have even thought, um, you know, that, that day on that beach of, you know, starting right. this idea, would we would be where we are now. But, um, you know, I've surrounded myself with passionate people that, that, wanna, that wanna be involved in this. Um, you know, my team are all so passionate um, and they're excited because we're pushing boundaries. You know, we're, we're really, I there feel you that, you know, sometimes you can be a bit despondent because it takes so long to get change to happen, you know, but it, it's, um, I keep telling them all the time, you guys are pushing boundaries. We're making people think about the way they do things. Um, and, and those changes do take time, but they do happen. Um, mm. And that's what I'm most excited about is, is being really influential in that space. I love this. So let's dive into your background a little. Like your, my understanding, and you, you'll tell us now that your background as is as a scientist, and scientists aren't typically or necessarily taught to be leaders of organizations. So, what is your background as a scientist, and was there a transition that had to occur that you just stepped into this role of also being not just scientist but leader of an organization? Well, look, I would say I'm a citizen scientist. I, I haven't been to university to be a scientist. I am, okay. um, I'm somebody that, um, you know, went to university for six months and decided this wasn't for me. I want to go travel the world. And nice. I was very lucky back then <laughs> that I was able to just jump on a plane and go wherever I wanted. Um, you know, I was actually a, a, a snowboarding person for a while. I lived in Austria for a while. I, no. I lived in Thailand for a while. I became a dive instructor. I experienced the world and um, I also saw the impact that humans have on the world um, and my connection to nature made me always conscious of, of that and my footprint as I was as going around the place but look I, I think that I'm a logical person I've always been a very logical problem kind of solving person um, and and that's what's driven me and I've surrounded myself with experts so you know I have scientists on a team I have experts in a whole variety of, of different fields on my team. I have government partners on my team and I have a gut instinct that's gone. So it's gone pretty well so far. So, um, you know, I utilize that framework. And I think that, you know, some of my um, board members in the past have kind of described me as, as a hub or a catalyst. And that's what I am. I bring, I bring the stakeholders and the people together that need to be together and try and facilitate that into a solution. And, and that's what I've been really good at. And that's what I love doing. Excellent. So you're just you're a natural leader to be able to do that, which is a critical uh, skill to have. Um, I got to ask, I want to dive a little into your background as an ocean lover. Um, how did your passion for the ocean begin? Was there an aha moment as a little girl on the beach or was it when you started scuba diving? How did, how did that passion start? Yeah, I mean, the ocean for me was another natural environment that I connected to really a lot. I mean, as a kid, I wanted to be a ranger. Um, I, I kind of feel like I've created my own organization to be my own type of ranger now. But, you know, one of my earliest memories as a, as a really little girl is um, I used to live close to the beach and um, they have a, an ocean swimming pool. Um, and I remember standing on the edge of this ocean swimming pool when I must have been about three or four doing swimming lessons in the pouring rain and my mother kind of hiding underneath the, the ledge of the, the toilet block, trying to stay out of the rain and, and learning to actually swim in one of these ocean swimming pools that are, you know, and, and just love being in the salt water. Um, you know, living in Thailand, that's always an eye opener. I used to come back from a dive with plastic stuffed into every part of my wetsuit in my pocket that I, that I could, that I would pick up on the way through. Um, mm. You know, so I've always been part of that clean up, you know, framework whenever there was that kind of opportunity. I just felt that 
that that's such a short term solution because we know that the next tide will bring more stuff in, you know, the next group of people on a beach will leave more litter. So it has a very short term impact. And while it has an immediate, um, you know, improvement of the environment, um, it will always be replaced. So I I guess I got frustrated with that to say, well, what actually needs to happen so that we don't have to keep picking up other people's rubbish? (laughs) (laughs) I hear you. Yeah, we do ocean cleanups here and I feel like it's a, and we'll talk more about this, but I feel like it's, it's a, people feel like they're taking some action, but you and I know it's just, we're going to, you go back in the water, you know, they, they go do the cleanup. Yay. And then they might go home and you, people like you and I are back in the ocean tomorrow and guess what's there? More trash. So um, it's frustrating, which is why I want to definitely spend time in this conversation talking about how do we stop it? Um, let's go back to the database for a minute though. And I, I hope this I hope this next question is taken the right way. Um, sometimes I feel that we can focus so much on data and the analysis of it. Uh, some call it science for the sake of science, and that it stops us from taking action when it comes to issues like marine pollution. So I guess, Heidi, I want you to prove me wrong. Why is data collection so important in, in the case of your work? I guess to get people to implement a source reduction, you know, plan at, at whatever scale that is, they need they need the reason, you know, why? Why should I care? Why should I change? Why should I make action? Why should I spend money? Whatever that reason is, it's the why. And so, you know, the data is is one of those um, those things that that you need to put on the table um, to get that movement happening. It, it it can't work on its own, and I I agree. I I have. Um, a lot of frustration around data sets that get collected a certain way for a certain project and then the project finishes, the report comes out and and then both of those things actually just get cobwebs on a shelf somewhere. So we wanted to create a platform that was really user friendly and and had practical application at at that scalable model. So it could be used Mm. locally, but at a a national level as well, an international level as well. And so um, we wanted people to understand how to use data themselves and not having to rely on it being used by a university or a government agency, that they could be the ones that presented their case in a way that was understandable and provided the evidence that was needed um, to make it an issue locally. And so I guess that that's, you know, that's a tool in itself. It's how to collect it as a, as a skill, but how to use it is, is a yeah. skill. And when we look at that AMDI network and, and the framework of, of AMDI, it has so many different parts of it. And, and in my, my thoughts is that they all have to happen together if we're going to solve this issue. So cleanups as a starting point, yes, immediate removal, um, short-term um, health improvement, but the, the opportunity to collect data. The data, if it's done in a consistent way at a large scale, then you have that opportunity to use it. And then how is it used? So you want the community to know how to use it. You want the government to know how to use it and that exists and that has credibility. And then you want it to be used um, in a way that can be measured as well. You know, so many people go, oh, there's so much rubbish here. There's no bins. We should have put a bin bin there. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows is it the right bin, whether people will use it, whether it is being used, whether it's in actually the right location. That part of it very, it gets missed a lot. And by making people measure change, and having that data, then you can really show, are we having the impact that we want? So I think that it's those skills that the community need in not just collecting data, but using data that gives yes. it its greatest value. Okay, good. Thank you for that answer, because I, I was a little worried it might offend you as someone who's all about collecting data, but your statement about how you didn't want just, to, you don't want to collect data and then it just sits on the shelf and gathers dust. It, it's turning that data into action. So. I, I appreciate that answer. Um, tangent question. I, I think I saw this on your website. How does your work tie into the UN Sustainability Development Goals? Um, so we're excited when there's a marine debris target um, in the Sustainability Goals under under mm. 14. Um, I guess in Australia, we, we, <laughs> we've been included in the Australian government's report on how they're meeting um, the Sustainable Development Goals. Although there is a big disconnect in Australia on, on how that happens, it's almost like they go and have a look at who's doing what and go, oh, yeah, we'll claim that as part of what's happening in Australia. <laughs> you know, they're, they're funding um, our program along the Great Barrier Reef, which is great. 
Um, mm -hmm. You know, our question to the government there is uh, the funding finishes in 2023. We know, of course, that marine debris will still exist. So to ensure that that wasn't a complete waste of time, what's going to happen next? Um, you know, so that, that's a question that we're doing. But I guess it's about providing a case study on how we've been able to establish this in Australia at a citizen science level that has now input from the government. So it wasn't designed by the government and then given to the citizen scientists. It was done the other way. So we, we have the power to, have, to, to make action whenever we want. You don't have to wait for it to, to be a, a political issue or a, a have political funding. You can just do it whenever you want. And this is a framework that you can adapt and you can utilise um, to, to get out there. And, and I think that that enables a scalable model to help other communities and other countries um, to also contribute to the sustainable development goals. But I, I think one of the things that, you know, a lot of times people think Tangaroa Blue is a clean up organisation and, and, you know, we very much try to say we're not, you know, that's part of what we do and it's a very public facing part of what yeah. we do. But we do so much in the background. And in some cases, we work with industry partners to get an awesome solution. And we can't actually shout it to the roof from the rooftops because um, that, would, um, that would put a, a risk on the partnership. So, so we've been able to get some really good solutions that, that maybe are done behind the scenes. Um, and that's, you know, that, that's, I guess, also the model is how do you work with the different sectors? Um, and sometimes they're not all forward facing and, and those kind of models can be used in, in any country mm. because you're just identifying the right, right stakeholders that you need at the table to get the right solution and you're giving a way to measure that as well. So we hope that this model can be used more broadly. Very good. And it, it, it feels like you have the right um, mindset to be happy with work getting done that's not forward facing, that's making a difference. Like. There's not a lot of ego in you that's like, look at look at us and how great we are. You you truly care about the problem and, and solution. So uh, I want to acknowledge you for that. Let, let's uh, I want to shift gears just a little bit uh, during the insanely fun and iconic Byron Blues Fest 2019. You teamed up with We Phil for an intimate beach cleanup with some pretty cool friends like Jack Johnson, Lucas Nelson, and Dirt Girl to help launch the global BYO bottle campaign. How did that come about? Yeah, that was exciting. Um, so Jack's been one of our ambassadors now since I think um, 2010. I've actually been on oh, each wow. of his Australian tours since since 2010, and and I actually did quite a lot of diving in Hawaii. Um, over the years too. So um, I know his Kokua Foundation. Um, oh. So we have a really good relationship with Jack and, and the foundation. And um, when we uh, teamed up with another AMD partner, who's We Refill, they provided these amazing water refill stations. Um, I think they did like 80 festivals in 2018, 2019, before the whole COVID thing hit. <laughs> um, and their machines are designed... Um, to use tap water. So they, they're not using spring water. And you can refill um, sparkling and cold and, and filtered water. So, you know, you're giving that cold water, which people really want. It's not a bubbler anymore. And so this was a great way to launch the BYO bottle um, campaign. And as part of that, we wanted to do a cleanup and, and really connect those things, right? So it's about what's in our environment, what the data is to do the collection, where did it come from, and how do we translate that into everyone's day-to-day -day lives in reducing their use of this material, which is just you know, everywhere in our environment. And so it's trying to put those pieces together. So we refill provided what we would call a source reduction project, and that is reducing single-use water bottles at events. Um, that particular event at Blues Fest re reduced 24,000 single-use water bottles back of house so every wow. single stage had one of their units um, on every single stage for the artists, for the crew, for all the admin staff, for the volunteers. And then there was a couple of um, stations out the front as well for front of house for the, for the visitors and the patrons that came to that event too. So it was to show what is possible if mm. everybody wants to work together. Now, one thing that comes out of that, which is a really interesting concept, because a lot of people are talking about like, like let's go water bottle free. Great concept but nobody really thinks about the impact outside of the environmental impact. And so one of the um, frameworks that came out of We Refill was about shifting single use plastic economy. You can't take away a product that provides someone with a revenue and replace it with nothing because then it's not going to be a long-term solution. 
So the re-reform model was about shifting the economy so nobody moved, except the only person that lost was the beverage company, which is fine because <laughs> we don't want their single-use water bottles anyway. So it was a it was a way to um, make sure that the revenue wasn't the thing that was going to the whole thing was going to hinge on, um, and that's why it was such a, a massive success. And so it was great to be able mm. to celebrate that with the cleanup as well. Very cool. When's the next Byron Blues Fest going to happen? Uh, at Easter, they just they just ran one in Easter, very scaled back uh, model. Okay. Unfortunately, we've had some pretty major flooding um, here as well. So um, that was a bit of an issue and, and COVID as well. So it wasn't what it used to be, um, okay. but they are looking to, to kind of redevelop that moving forward. Nice. And I, I didn't realize you knew Jack Johnson since, what did you say, 2010? So yeah, yeah. A long time. <laughs> Have you had recent communication? And I know he's supported you and he's, uh, you know, promoted you on social media and whatnot, but are, are you still in communication and, and doing cool stuff together? Yeah, we do. Um, through the Johnson Ohana Foundation, um, they give us uh, one of their mini grants every year that we can do some education stuff and school stuff. So we, we do have a really good ongoing and long-term communication with, with those guys. A big aloha to them if they're listening. <laughs> For sure. Oh, that's awesome. Very cool. So I want to hear about your ambassadors. Uh, it seems like you have seasoned veterans of the environmental movements representing your interests, but also have several very young, passionate wildlife and ocean stewards. Let's hear about them. Yeah, our ambassadors um, kind of organically um, came about that, that program and those people. And it was because they were already doing amazing work in the environment. They were already contributing data to the database. They, they were already part of that AMBI network. Um, and they went out of their way to teach others and to engage others. And so that's how why we invited those, those guys to be ambassadors. So we have Bernadette, mm -hmm. um, also known as Flea. And, uh, and Flea is, actually works for a local council down in, in the southern area of New South Wales. Um, and has spent um, a lot of her time working, developing a local marine debris working group and training all these people. And she had this great program where um, people had to be trained in how to collect data at their local beach and they had to actually submit a data set and then they were able to have one of their pre-loved t-shirts screen printed to say they were part of the group now. So there was this reward for going through that process. Um, and then some of our younger kids, they're just, you know, I used to I used to love going and talking to schools and, and stuff when I was a lot lot younger. They don't necessarily want to listen to a, an old lady anymore. So these young oh. young kids, you know, they, they get in there and they can talk to their peers and they're so passionate and they love it. And, and so we love working with the next generation. You know, we need we need that passion and, and not the um, the lack of hope, you know, about what's happening to our environment, our climate, um, our oceans. We, we don't want people to be in such despair as they go through to feel like there's no point in doing anything. So these young kids, they just, they ooze hope and, mm. and passion and they don't have the fear of failure. You know, they, they, we can fix this and I'm going to show you how. And so we just love their energy and we love working and supporting those guys as well. That's got to keep you inspired. And it sounds like um, they just, yeah, I, it sounds like they kind of get it, right? Maybe at a level that our generation doesn't or maybe doesn't even want to look at, right? Yeah, and they've been part of source reduction projects themselves. So they've seen the success. Mm. You know, um, Elijah, one of the young ambassadors, he was doing one of our Great Barrier Reef cleanups and, and along the river he found this pipe that was popping out of the, the rock wall and had all these tiny little um, plastic, uh, they were biofilters. And he was actually able to, um, we were able to track these biofilters back to a, a seafood shop um, that had, was up the road. And these biofilters had been escaping out of their, their wet tanks. Um, and the guy didn't even know. And so he was able to work with that local business to find mm. a solution and then say, hey, I've, I've been part of the solution. So, um, you know, again, it's not just about them doing cleanups and being able to do the data, but it's been able to use that data for their own communities and, and show how those successes can happen. That's amazing. I, I heard you say somewhere that um, you don't believe in naming and shaming. And I am 100% with you on that. Uh, sometimes I think activists are counterproductive when they make offenders wrong for what they're doing. And personally, I don't ever call myself an activist. I, I prefer the word conservationist. So I'm curious your thoughts on that. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, sometimes the activists go to the name and shame um, as the first point of contact. And, and that's that's where I think the, the problem is. I think that it, it's also, it is an option, but it's always going to be my last option. If nothing else is going to work, then eventually you're going to have to call somebody out publicly. So yeah. um, I think that um, we... We need to be not only naming and shaming, but we also be, um, you know, naming and feigning. So we need to mm. give the good stories out there as well. And that's really, really important. Otherwise, it's always just bad news. Um, and, and so I think that providing the opportunity for um, different industry groups and businesses and governments to be part of telling the success stories is really, is really, really important and how those collaborations have reached that that point. And, you know, we've been part of some programs with um, businesses and, and industries that conservationists, I guess, technically or, or traditionally wouldn't really work with, but we found common ground. We've had mm. a solution or we've had a project that we, we want to both see achieve and, and that's provided a platform. And that platform has enabled us to also build some trust um, mm. that we can have some more difficult conversations moving forward as, as well. And, and so, you know, that's, that's really important. Um, we can't you know, we can't um, make the conservation sector feel like they have to solve everything. You know, they can be the catalyst, but mm -hmm. they need to have all the stakeholders at the table to make the changes. We can't do all of that on our own. And providing a platform that's negative isn't going to enable those conversations to happen. I love it. Name and fame versus name and shame. And you're 100% right. If, if you know ultimately to create the solution you want, that you need to be working with these companies that you and I both know are probably doing bad things, if we just go to them and say, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad, they're not going to want to sit down and talk to you. It's it's kind of common sense. So I'm, I'm glad that that's your um, way of operating. And I, I'm 100% with you on that one. Let's, let's it is. And I, I would just add one more thing to that if I, if I can. And, and the thing is that it's not just about like what working together means mm -hmm. is not you know, we don't receive money or checks from, from companies that don't align with our values and with our, our goals. Um, you know, that's a very different thing to being able to work together on a project that has, has an outcome. Um, and, and I think that that's really important. I think that at the moment, the greenwashing that's happening in the sector is, is really concerning. Yeah. And we've got marketing companies and big companies that think that making a change and having green credentials is just giving somebody a check. And that's not what we do. We only work with organizations that we can influence and see something, um, you know, happen that's better. Um, otherwise, you know, it, it's kind of off the table. So we do have a, a criteria of, of who we're going to work with, but the way we work with them is in a collaborative model. Excellent. Thank you for, for clarifying that. Um, let's go back to marine debris. What are the biggest sources that you are seeing and you kind of touched on this before. Tell us how it varies from place to place. Yeah, so when we go to Cape York and we work with um, our amaz amazing Indigenous uh, ranger teams that are up in, in remote Australia, um, you know, these communities are a thousand kilometres away from the nearest city. Mm. Um, they have very small communities and they have massive country to manage. Um, and when you go to the coastlines along there, um, you can see some of the most impacted coastline in Australia um, in respect to marine debris. And 99% of that stuff is coming from offshore sources. Definitely. So we have, you know, cargo ships, we have international commercial fisheries, we have um, marine debris entering from different areas um, uh, and, and then coming through on ocean currents. Um, the majority, 90% plus will be plastics. Um, a lot of it will be the, some kind of containers or, or fishing gear. Um, and the biggest problem, of course, is that it continually fragments and breaks up. So, you know, the majority of it is in the process of breaking up into a smaller piece, which makes it, you know, so hard to remove if you can possibly remove it. And of course, the big issue with the remote communities. So what do you do with it once you've removed it from the beach? Because there's no curbside recycling system that's, <laughs> yeah, right. that's there. So it's a really challenging environment. And, and the majority of it is coming from offshore. Whereas if we go to a beach around one of our um, urban areas or, or one of our cities, we know that the majority of it's coming from the catchment. It's litter items, it's cigarette butts, it's food packaging, it's those single use items that might get used once for five seconds and then, and then disposed of. Um, and a lot of it's un, unnecessary stuff as well, that if we just thought about um, materials and, and packaging that we wouldn't actually need in, in the first place. So 
Um, you know, but the majority again is plastic. So we know plastic is the number one problem regardless of where we go. It's just the source that will change depending on how far away you are from a city or an urban area. Makes sense. And we'll we'll talk about cigarette butts and also microplastics. What's the most dangerous thing that you find? Oh, um, <laughs> well, actually, one of our team had one on the, the weekend. Um, back in 2012, we started finding these things. We call them silver canisters. They're, they're like a silver metal um, container with a, a yellow bung lid. And they started washing up in, in weird places back in 2012. And, and we still get the odd one washing up, which we, we picked one up um, on the weekend. Um, and they're actually full of um, pellets that are fumigants for the cargo ships or silos where there's grain. So they kill rodents. And oh whether a container of them was lost or a box of them was lost, um, they keep re-emerging. The problem is, is that they can be fatal to inhale or ingest and the container themselves has no warning label on it or any label on it whatsoever. And it looks like a really cool bottle. So people kind of pick it up and go, that's, you know, that's cool. I'll, I'll wash that out and use it for whatever oh my God. Um, without knowing how um, potentially fatal it can be. So, um, yeah, one of the team had one of them pop up at a cleanup that we actually did last weekend. Holy cow. I, I, my guess would have been that you would have said ghost nets would be the dangerous thing you're finding out there, not silver canisters, but you mentioned fishing nets. You must be finding a lot of disregarded fishing gear that's obviously not good for anything. Yeah, we do in certain areas. Um, the Gulf of Carpentaria, for example, um, is an area that ocean currents come from the Arafura Sea. Um, there used to be a lot of unregulated fishing happening in there um, and the ghost nets uh, were getting, all, all, fishing nets were being either lost or run over by other boats. Um, and the ghost nets that the rangers were finding up there, they could get, you know, 250 plus a year. Um, and we know that, you know, they just continually kill wildlife um, when they, they yeah. impact. So uh, I guess one of the bigger problem is that we still find ghost nets. We're not finding them in as massive numbers as we, we were, you know, maybe five, six, 10 years ago, um, which is good news. But mm -hmm. uh, the response to a ghost net when it's in a remote location is the problem. Um, someone finds that they report it, it could take two weeks for someone to go and get it. And by that stage, where's it gone? Um, and so, you know, it, it, takes, it takes time um, to be able to address those things. And, and a lot of them then get lost in the process. That's a tough one. What's, uh, what's the craziest or most interesting, interesting thing that you found while collecting trash? We find weird stuff. We find interesting. I mean, you never know. We had a, we actually had a, a little sports camera that got found um, last year on one of our island cleanups that we were able to plug in and charge up, and and we actually found the owner of it who was in New Zealand who had lost it um, several years years before. Oh it God. kind of went a bit viral um, over social media. Everyone was because it had the picture of this guy. It was like you could nice. see him clearly, yeah. And so we were able to <laughs> find him on social media. Which, that was kind of fun. Um, we had a, a water bottle or a glass bottle that washed up in one of our remote um, communities with a letter in it that was written Ooh. in Indonesian. And we were able to get it translated. And it was a letter from a young girl in Indonesia. And it was a letter to a, a Hollywood uh, movie star. And she had been writing this letter to this movie star for his birthday. And um, she didn't have the money to buy a postage stamp. So she put this letter into this bottle and thrown it at the ocean with a hope that um, it no would reach this, this, <laughs> this Bollywood actor uh, for his birthday and how much that she was in love with him. Um, <laughs> you know, did you get, so, did you get so, the letter to him? No. Did you track <laughs> the guy now? We weren't. No, we were, we're still trying. We weren't able to, we weren't able to reach him, but you know, we just thought that that that's wild. And and then just the weird things, you know, like false teeth or you know, um, <laughs> yeah, just we, weird items. Anything that you could probably list, we found it at, at least once. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I saw a breast implant somewhere and and doing some homework on you. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I no idea. <laughs> Don't even want to think about how that got yeah, there. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm not sure how that got there. Oh gosh, that's fun. Um, good times, right? So let's let's go back to beach cleanups. I've always felt like, and we talked about this a little, like they're okay. They allow people to take some action, but obviously we need to stop the flood of plastics into the ocean. So please share what, what can be done? What are you guys doing about this? 
Yeah, I, I guess one of the most ironic things that I see is people rock up to a, a clean up with a single use water bottle or a single use takeaway coffee cup and you're just like, it, it, that's the thing, right? How do you connect this with this? Um, mm. I, I, and, the, and a clean up is a really good way of doing that because people then understand um, that every piece of rubbish that they pick up, pick up has a story, right? It, it's come from somewhere, it's passed through somebody's hand and then it, it creates some kind of tangible connection to the stuff that passes through everybody's hands and where that might end up. So I, I think that that's a really important, um, not just the, the cleanup and the removal, but it provides a really good education um, opportunity as well. And the amount of times that I've heard people go into a cleanup at a beach that they considered clean and, and say at the end of the cleanup, wow, I can't believe how much we found. You know, it means that um, you've opened people's eyes to something that they weren't seeing before and you can never close your eyes once you've opened them to something. Mm. So, so that, you know, it's, it's what we call state of knowledge, right? We've increased their state of knowledge and you can never go backwards. So <laughs> you can only go right. forward. So it can be a real starting point. Um, yeah. and, and then it's about, you know, identifying what people use in their, in their day-to-day life. You know, there's been a, a social media post where they say, oh, it's only one straw, so there's 8 billion people. That's the kind of thing. You know, it's that ongoing trickle effect that accumulates mm. rather than the one-off mass spill kind of thing. Um, and people can be proactive. Now, our society has gone to a point where we want everything to be cheap and convenient and easy. Well, look at our environment. This is exactly the reason our environment is in the state that it is, because we want things to be easy, cheap and convenient. Right. And we need to start transitioning from that. So, you know, um, when people go, oh, I keep forgetting my shopping bags. Really? <laughs> That's the excuse. All right. So how do we how do we remember to bring our own reusable shopping bags to the shop? How do we remember to take our, our own bottle and to, to refill it? So we still need to make those actions convenient and easy and not super expensive. Mm -hmm. um, but we need people to actually start taking responsibility for themselves as well. So we are all impacting, you know, even the most green <coughs> conservationist on the planet has an impact. It's, oh, yeah. it's what we choose to do with that impact. Um, and I would say for those people that are doing everything they can that get frustrated with the people around them is don't because you're a role model and you would be absolutely surprised at how much influence that you have just by doing the good thing yourself. Um, and, you know, I used to, to see it before we had um, single use plastic bag bans in, in the state that I live in. You know, mm -hmm. I, I would go to the supermarket to go and buy some bits and pieces and, and I'd see somebody that I know and instead of saying hi to me, they would turn around with this absolute look of horror and then look at their trolley and look at me as if, you know, oh my God, you know, it's just it's just this once I didn't bring my bags. And, <laughs> you know, it's that, it's that influence that you have because people know the expectation. Um, and so don't get despondent. Keep doing the good stuff. You are influencing your network. Nothing like a little guilt, right, <laughs> to make some change. But you're not doing it. They're, they're guilty of themselves. Yeah, totally. Yeah. That's, that's good. Um, let's go back to microplastics. We, we kind of glided over it. They're pretty much impossible to remove. Uh, first of all, is that correct? And are there innovations that you are privy to or instigating? Yeah, and I think when we talk about microplastics, we need to look at them in, ver in two very different sectors. So we have primary and secondary microplastics. So when we look at um, primary microplastics, we're looking at microplastics that are actually a product themselves. So they're used as a microplastic. Mm. Secondary microplastics are things that were bigger that are in the process of fragmenting and breaking up. So they were yeah. something else and now they've been disposed of and UV and the rest of it is, is making them break up. So I think that if we look at primary microplastics, um, this is something that it kind of, it, it's, it kind of is a bit frustrating as well in that these are mainly lost um, through the production of plastic products through the plastic manufacturers and the transportation logistic um, systems. And um, we're basically talking about bad housekeeping in a factory. So, you know, when we look at a one ton bulker bag full of plastic resin pellets, which are like the size of a grain of rice, and they're used to blow mold into a plastic product. In one of those one ton bulker bags can be 40 million plastic resin pellets. Wow. So when you have a spill of a cup, we're talking thousands and thousands of microplastics and it falls on the ground, nobody cleans it up, it rains or gets trodden on and gets stuck in someone's shoe, then it enters the stormwater system and then it enters, enters the environment. So we're basically talking about bad housekeeping and the industry has absolutely um, a responsibility 
and an opportunity to prevent that loss from their operations. And they're just not doing it. You know, Operation Clean Sweep is a program that the industry developed in the US back in 1992 for a zero pellet loss from the industry back in 92. 92. Now, currently it's in about 22 countries. In 2015, Tangaroa Blue was responsible for bringing it to Australia. It wasn't even happening within the, the Australian industry. And we partnered mm -hmm. um, with uh, Chemistry Australia, who's the plastics industry, to roll this out through the industry. And, you know, for the first couple of years, it's, it's like hitting your head against a brick wall. Why can't we get the industry to adopt best practice when they already should be doing it? And when there's already legislation in place um, to be enforcing it if they don't, but none of it's happening. So I think that from that perspective, we need the industry to take absolute responsibility for the loss of microplastics from their operations. And it has to be done immediately. And things like, you know, traps within their, their premises, cleanups, um, protocols, procedures, standard operating procedures. We're not talking right. about, you know, anything that's super difficult to do. It's just about putting the focus on it. Um, and then when we're looking at the secondary microplastics, um, we're looking at things that are fragmenting. So the cleanup is actually a really good way of preventing one bottle from ending up as a million small bits. That's so right. it's great that we're removing it from there because we know the smaller uh, an item is, the more expensive and difficult and time consuming it actually is to remove it. So while we, we get those items while they're intact, it, it's really important. And I would also say that educating people around what happens to plastics is really important. And you might have noticed that I've said plastic breaks up, not plastic breaks down. Oh. Because if I say it breaks down, people think it goes away eventually. And we know plastic doesn't, it just gets smaller until you can't mm. see it, but it hasn't miraculously disappeared. So we want people to understand that plastic breaks up. It becomes a bigger problem. It becomes more time consuming and expensive um, to remove. Um, and we know that at the moment, we don't have the technology to filter that out. So it's in our blood, it's in our air, it's in our water, it's in our soil, it's everywhere. It's in our fish, it's in our children, it's everywhere. You, you mentioned um, industry responsibility. I wanna know how you're dealing with government responsibility. Our, are they on board and supportive to make what you're doing grow bigger? Uh, you, you brought up the Great Barrier Reef a couple times. It seems like it would be better for tourism if all the beaches and reefs were cleaner, tires removed, fishing nets, you know, repurposed and whatnot. So how are you dealing with the government? Obviously, they're giving you money, um, so they must, you must have some <laughs> good relationship with them. Oh, uh, look, um, it's a, a government will invest in things that are politically um, you know, important to the public at the time. Um, and that's what I guess the problem is. And, and it's in every country you have, um, you know, you have political cycles and you have how long someone's going to be in power for and, and they want to be popular. They want to be reelected. And no, we, don't have, that we don't have those problems in the US. Our government's just <laughs> very smooth. Everybody loves each other. Well, I guess so that's the problem though, you know, like it doesn't mean that decisions are being made um, for the right reasons or the right decisions being made. And, and that's, um, you know, yeah. that can be frustrating. But yeah. uh, I mean, we've had some we've had some successes, you know, back in 2004 when Tangaroa Blue started, like the first big cleanup that I did, we collected data. We identified in a workshop two weeks after what the main items were that we were finding. We identified one item that we knew that was coming from a local source that we thought that there was a solution for. And we started working with the industry and the government. And six years later, we got the legislative change. Now, you know, six years for a no brainer for me was like, really, it took that long? <laughs> Apparently that was fast, but we got no. there. We were able to change legislation from citizen science data, engaging the right stakeholders. So this for me shows that this model will work yes. because you're providing the evidence that's needed in the format with the right people. So um, so it, it, it works, it just takes time and you have to hang in there. Um, at the moment, you know, one of our AMBI partners is, is called uh, No Balloon Release Australia and they're trying to work on um, uh, stopping balloon releases or making balloon releases illegal. Now, one of our states in Australia, New South Wales, it's legal to release 19 balloons into the environment, but it's illegal to release 20 balloons into the environment. Oh now, nobody God. can explain to me when we know one what? balloon will kill wildlife. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, she's been um, working with data and, and working at a, an industry, uh, government level, sorry, to, to try and um, find a way to have that legislation change. 
And one of the ways that she's been doing that is also to look at helium. Um, and the Northern Territory government yesterday actually released um, new legislation to say that it's illegal to use helium in balloons because that will now stop balloon releases, both accidental and deliberate. So mm. now we're tackling the helium. And we know that that's a finite resource on the planet as well. I was so, going to say, it's a finite yeah. resource for sure, yeah. 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 So it's, it's about just finding the drivers. And, and I guess that that's one of the things is, is, is how can somebody make the decision that you want them to? My driver is from a conservation sector, right? But not everybody cares about turtles. So what do they care about? And how do we get them to the same point okay. using that as the driver? Smart. Yeah, balloons is an issue I've been working on for five years. And it looks like in the next few months, they're finally going to ban the sale and release of balloons right in the little town that I live in. And it's it's kind of like you were saying to me, no brainer. Why, why you know? I'm going to be I'm going to be stewing on the 19 balloon issue all night. By the way, that makes no sense to me. 19, no problem. 20, no. Uh oh, OK, let's move on. Let's move on to another challenging topic. I I interviewed uh, Cyril Gooch of Parlay for the Oceans, and he said flat out that recycling is a failed technology. As you know, a very small percentage of recycled items are truly recycled and reused. So what are your thoughts here? Is recycling an antiquated technology and is there a better solution? Um, look, I think that we've, we've hung our hopes too high on recycling as being the solution. Um, I think that we all know that. Uh, unfortunately, we continue to invest in it uh, and not actually in further upstream, which is where we need that investment to be. So, mm -hmm. so I would agree that recycling is definitely not the solution, although it does have a place. It, we can't just say no to recycling but we only need to be using recycling as the one step up from landfill, as opposed to the top of the waste hierarchy. Um, at the moment, Australia is going through, you know, a transition like a lot of other countries where we can't just ship our waste to a third world country to deal with. Um, and so we've been looking at ways of, um, you know, increasing our recycling in Australia. The, the problem with this is um, there's no criteria um, against what is being made out of the recycled content. It's like, can we make something out of it? Yes, okay, do it. Um, and not actually seeing whether that product that's coming out from it is fit for purpose or creates harm. And, and I think an example of that um, that we're currently working on at the moment is um, rubber crumb. So we have 48 million tires a year that get retired from our cars in Australia. Um, and we want to know what do we do with these tyres. And, and so there's been significant investment from state and federal government um, funding grants to create more and more recycling of tyres into products like rubber crumb that we then go and make um, kids play areas with mm. um, so that they don't crack their head when they fall off the play equipment. Um, the problem is, is that we know from our research that um, the degradation of these rubber crumb surfaces can happen within weeks of it being installed. Um, we know that there's something like 307 chemicals in tires that um, because of the increased surface area after they're shredded, release a lot easier. Over mm. 190 of those are known carcinogenics. So let's go let our kids play on that as well. Um, and we have some research that's come out of Canada to show that some of the, the dust from the tires um, actually have been responsible for up to 90% of the salmon kill in some of their rivers. So we know that these products are bad for our environment, they're bad for our human health, and yet we've got governments investing in them because they tick off some recycling target without actually um, analysing whether, whether that product is fit for purpose or if is it just going to make more harm. Um, and, you know, we've been trying to engage local councils at the moment in assessing all of their parks that they've used this product for and not using it in the future. Um, and it's been an eye opener for the local councils because the state and federal government have been pushing them to use it because it's recycled content. Um, and, and that's just an example of where we're using products that are not fit for purpose um, just to get stuff out of landfill. Um, and it's not getting it out of landfill. It's really just delaying landfill. Delaying it, exactly. that product, you know, is degrading. It's not going to stand up for it, its life and it's going to get ripped up and end up in landfill anyway. We've just given it one other opportunity to harm the environment and harm human health in the meantime. Um, yeah, definitely. Okay. Wow. So a couple more topics. 
Um, you, you brought up cigarette butts a, a while back. Uh, Steve Reese, who's the executive producer of this show, one of his biggest pet peeves is cigarette butts. He's, he talks about it all the time, and I'm pretty sure you share that same pet peeve. Uh, tell us about Ditch the Flick. Yeah, we've been really excited about this project. So when COVID hit um, in Australia, we used to run all these source reduction workshops where we'd go to communities and we would you know, work with the community to develop these programs. And, and when COVID hit and we couldn't do that, we started to transition these workshops online. And so they, you know, they were open to anybody that wanted to come and not just one community. And out of um, the workshop, we wanted to tackle cigarette butts because it's the number one littered item that we find you know, in our urban area cleanups. Um, and we wanted to really understand um, that point of release. Okay, so what, what causes the smoker to, to flick? Um, and, you know, we've heard all these solutions um, about, you know, voting butt boards and, and fines and all of these kind of things. And, and what we really discovered is most of the solutions that are proposed to reduce cigarette butt litter come from non-smokers. And, and when we started to talk about smokers, about what the issues were, they were totally different things that they actually wanted. And so that was our first wow. aha thing is, is that we need to talk to the smokers about how do we stop littering and stop talking to the non-smokers because they really don't have a clue. Makes sense. Um, and so that's where Ditch the Flick was born. So um, we worked, uh, one of the first projects that we, we did was actually with the, um, the Queensland Country Bank Stadium, which is up in Townsville along the Great Barrier Reef. And they run, um, the stadium has the big football games um, up there. And so they have a massive cigarette butt litter issue during the, the games. And, uh, and so we worked with the, the stadium in how to implement Ditch the Flick. Um, and one of the things that we did first was we just went and talked to smokers um, at the game about where could, we, where could someone go and have a ciggy. And, and they, they all just said, oh, just anywhere. Like, there's no place, there's no nothing, there's, you know. And so we thought, well, this is part of the problem is the smokers are walking around just smoking wherever they want. There's no infrastructure. They've got half time. They've got 10 minutes to run out quickly and then go back in again because right. you can't smoke inside the stadium. Right. So it was about understanding what the barriers were to smokers to actually do the right thing and providing them with the area and the infrastructure that, that they needed. Now, we were so lucky that the stadium was so on board in being practical with this project um, and wanted to do you know, whatever it took. And we got a 71% reduction in cigarette butt litter just in the first five games Wow. Of the season last year it's massive <laughs> that is massive. so a lot of learnings out of that and we've been able to um to now work with other areas on on ditch the flick as well and we just think it's a, a really good way to engage smokers and and um into doing good behavior that reduces litter by understanding actually what they need and, and when you think about where smokers are pushed out to have a cigarette um most of the time it's all this signage that says no smoking but you don't actually tell them where they can go. So they go and sneak behind a corner somewhere <laughs> and that's where you get all the litter. Um, and so it's really understanding right. those barriers. Yeah. You're, you're a very logical person, Heidi. I like this. <laughs> don't talk to the non-smokers, talk to the darn smokers. It only makes sense. Last topic I want to bring up is Operation Clean Sweep Australia, which is an international program in Australia that you coordinate, which aims to reduce the loss of plastic feedstock during manufacturing and transport. Transport, the only conservation NGO coordinating this program internationally, as I understand. Uh, what can you share about this program? Yeah, this has been a great model. Um, when we uh, discovered what a plastic resin pellet, also known as a noodle was back in, in 2007, um, you know, we thought that this stuff was coming off ocean currents. And, and then we started to um, go up our, our rivers and our creeks and our major urban areas. We started walking around the streets and in our industrial areas. And we discovered really quickly that there was um, a significant leak of plastic resin pellets um, from our own domestic plastics industry. Um, we also discovered that it's not just plastic resin pellets, which are you know raw virgin plastic. It's, it's actually all types of feedstock, which include recycled chip and powder and flake. Um, that's escaping from our, our um, industry areas. And we discovered that there was a program internationally um, called Operation Clean Sweep that had been developed by the plastics industry in the US to address this, but it wasn't in Australia. So mm. we really thought this was a no brainer to put a bit of focus um, on the issue is getting engaged with the industry. And, 
And so we were able to get some funding um, from the Victorian state government because most of the plastics industry has presence in Victoria um, and work with uh, Chemistry Australia who helped us take all of the American resources and make them Aussie, um, you know, in regards to language and, and equipment <laughs> and so forth. Um, and then we started working in rolling this out with the industry. And, and one thing that we discovered really quickly was that most of the industry didn't think that they were contributing to the problem. Hmm. Um, you know, they didn't realize that a trickle every day equated to a really lot of micro microplastic times, you know, 300 factories in, in a catchment. Um, they didn't see that that as being a massive problem because it, it was small. Um, the other thing we found was that there was no compliance response in Victoria. And so when we went to the local councils and said, hey, these are polluters, um, you, there needs to be a compliance response that they considered it an EPA, so a state government EPA issue, um, where the state government EPA considered it um, not to trigger their metric of pollution, which was two cubic metres or something like that. So they said, oh, it's a local council issue. So nobody was doing any compliance. The plastics industry was just operating as they wanted to, some better than others, um, and some really atrocious. So while we went to work really closely with the industry on best practice, we also had to work with state and, um, and uh, local government to figure out who was going to do the compliance. Um, and in 2018, the Victorian EPA actually issued a guidance in handling plastic resin pellets. And so from there, they've been doing the compliance response. Um, and even more excitingly, um, at the beginning of 2020, Operation Clean Sweep was actually listed in the Australian National Plastics Plan at a federal level as a target. So mm. as a, an NGO being able to influence best practice within the plastics wow. industry, you know, we're really proud of that. And when you look at Operation Clean Sweep internationally, it's all run by the plastics industry. This mm -hmm. is the only place where it's done in collaboration with an NGO. And we think that that actually provides um, some credibility around the program because we will hold them to account. We will report polluters to the EPA um, and we will also engage with the industry by providing whatever support and resources that we can for them to adopt best practice. So there is no excuse for this. Um, and I think it just needs a, a much heavier hand on mm. reducing the loss of this feedstock. Heidi, I got to tell you, you're a bit of a badass. I love it. There's there's so many <laughs> people and organizations out there that maybe have a, a bigger forward facing, you know, name or, or whatnot, but the work that you guys are doing, I'm, I'm very, very impressed and blown away. So thank you for everything that you're sharing here. Just a couple final things as we wind down. Um, you talked about Elijah earlier and the hope of the youth of these ocean heroes that you work with. You know, for people like you and I that are so concerned and caring about these issues. And I think for, for most people these days, it, these problems seem overwhelming, not only plastic, but all the other challenges the ocean and the planet are facing. How, how do you do it? How do you retain hope in the face of all this grim data? I, I think that it's really important to occasionally look behind you and see where we've come from, as opposed to always just looking forward about what we have to achieve and what we have to still do. And when we, when we look at this space, you know, 2004 when I started, there was one state in Australia that had a container deposit scheme. Nobody was talking about plastic bag bans. Nobody was talking about single use plastic bans. Um, and now if we look, you know, at, at Australia, we have um, container deposit schemes in every single state. Um, we have every state looking at not only single use shopping bag bans, but single use plastic bans. Um, we have microplastics, we have a national plastics plan, we have um, marine debris integrated into um, school curriculums. Um, we have a massive awareness, you know, as I said, back in 2004, people thought I was talking about driftwood when I was talking about marine debris. Now, if you walk down the street, nine out of 10 people um, will tell you there's oceans, our oceans have plastics in them and that's a bad thing. Like we have come far. Mm. And, and people need to look behind occasionally. It's like doing a cleanup, you know, occasionally look behind and look how good it looks and what you've been able to achieve. Mm. And, I, and I think that that is part of it, is keeping the hope, is that change is possible. It's not going to happen overnight. And in most cases, it takes way too long to happen, but it will happen if we continue to be consistent um, and persistent. And we do it with a smile, which is my other mantra. You know, <laughs> that's how we have to do this. 
We need people to understand the issue. We need the data. We need the evidence. We need the passion. Um, and we need just to keep going. This is not an easy fix or an easy solution, but there is solutions there. We now have on the table at a UN level, a global treaty on plastic pollution. Like who would have thought that 10 years ago? So don't get despondent. We are moving, we are changing, we are shifting. The momentum is growing. Now is not the time to lose hope. Now we're finally getting somewhere. Let's keep pushing and let's keep going. <laughs> wow, I love it. Very well said. So. Heidi, we will definitely share links to everything that we talked about and people can find out about more about you and your organization. If people do want to get involved with what you're doing, what's, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, look, reach out on our email, uh, on our socials. We're on all the socials. Um, you know, do a cleanup, do your own cleanup. If you are doing cleanups every time you go for a walk, download the app, record your data, be part of that input of data and evidence that we need so desperately you know, to, to make the change. So just get involved, be present, be aware, and don't get caught by the greenwash. If people are telling you that they're making stuff out of ocean bound plastic or ocean plastic, and it sounds like a really good solution, ask the questions, make sure they're not greenwashing you, invest and support real credibility. And that means you need to do a bit of due diligence. So ask the questions and be part of the solution. Heidi Tate, I am extremely impressed. I really love this conversation. Uh, I've learned a lot. I know that our viewers uh, have also done that. So I just want to say on behalf of our community, thank you so much for spending this time with us today. You are a true inspiration and keep, uh, keep doing the good work. You're out there every day doing it and I completely admire you for it. So that is our show, everybody. We will see you next time. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.